I never thought I was particularly the class clown. And then someone asked me this and I went, oh, yes, I remember that. When I was, <laughs> because I didn't, I didn't become a comic till I was late 20s, till a lot of the rest of my life had gone wrong. Um, but, and I didn't think it was something I could do at all. And then I did it first time and went, I'm doing this for the rest of my life. It was completely like that. Having said that, when I was nine years old, I was at school and sports was rained off for the afternoon and somebody had brought in a wig and I don't know why, it was a school play or something. And it was all boys' school, and there was a long brown wig, and boys started getting up in front of the class, because we was all with the teacher there, and doing impressions. And I was up every other time. Sat you know, at nine years old. I say I'm not a camp man, I was doing Shirley Bassey. Um, I was doing, every, I was up and down and thought, yeah, I actually, there's a little show off within me. I always think I remember myself as this meek, sweet little boy. And actually, no, I was, I was a little show off. The great thing about stand-up was I always wanted to be a writer-performer, but I always, I, you know, I wasn't... I did do English at school. I did do English at, at um, English A-level. But I've, all, I've never felt that confidence as a writer. I'm still not sure about the use of semicolons, things like that. But stand-up is the writing you want to do if you feel like I might not obey the grammatical rules. The only rule in stand-up is, is to be funny. So if you don't think you're that intellectual, even though most of us are, um, it's the it's the thing to go into. So I so I think there's something very freeing about it. So for me, it was always that. And also, there's there's a couple of methods. If you there are books on writing stand up comedy. There's a guy. Is it? I don't even remember the name of the guy. This is how much I'm not an expert in in um, the, you know, the academia of stand up. But there's two methods of writing that I was always told about: rant and rave, and I think it's Jean Perret or something, which was all about making lists of stuff and seeing where jokes are. But for me, the best the best way to write stand-up comedy is to get on a subject that you feel passionately about, record yourself ranting about it, then turn it off and take out where you've been funny. Because if you care passionately about something and you have a strong opinion about something, for some reason you end up being funny about it. I really believe this. I mean, the best jokes I ever write are things I actually deeply care about, but you become ridiculous in your caring about something. So for me, that's always been a method into comedy. I think most of my jokes are about something that I feel strongly about, usually about myself, but also about society and politics and, and people. Um, so it's very, it's very cathartic comedy. It's a, it is, I don't know why I'm such a mess still psychologically, because you're getting rid of stuff the whole time. It's great, you actually get to express yourself. And as long as you're funny, you know, you can express, it's self-expression. My first gig was lovely and cosy. Um, and it was a door split. We probably did get two pounds or something. There's, these friends of mine, they used to run a gig called The Crock of Wit in uh, Notting Hill. It was downstairs beneath an Italian restaurant. It was incredibly middle class. It was, you know, it was, what was it? The Metropolitan Elite we were playing to. Um, it, was it, was, it was in the late 90s. It was incredibly cosy. I think my sisters had come. I have two older sisters who were very tense and they were in the sort of third row doing this. Um, and uh, I, used to, I was a smoker then. I must have smoked five cigarettes in about 10 minutes before going on. Um, I was terrified, but I got... You, do you know what? It was, it was the first time I was very scared, but I came off and I did well. And I knew when I walked off, I went, I, I also knew it was slightly like a drug addiction, even though I've never been a drug addict, but it was like a boost of like, <laughs> never been a drug addict, I'd like to put that, but you know, you walked off and went, whoa, that was, apps. I want to do that again. And even though I'm quite a neurotic person, naturally, um, it was just, it's just fantastic. It's, it's, you never quite match it. And I must admit, I've been on stage at the O2 in sort of, you know, 12, 13,000 people. Um, and you still don't match the first time that people laugh at jokes that you've thought up, written up first before them, and you're getting a laugh from strangers. Ah! Oh. oh, I don't know. Because the first gig I thought, I can do this. I was quite, quite, even though I'm, you know, seemed quite neurotic, I, I was quite confident that, that I could make a living doing it. Um, I would say it's, there is set, there is, there's no one big break. There's about 50. There's the big break when you're a tr new act and you get booked to do a spot at a club. That is massive. You get booked to do a spot at a club and they're going to pay you it's like 30 quid to do a 10-minute spot and someone's paying you to do it. That's a massive thrill. 
the next big thrill is when Don Ward at the comedy store says to you, I want to put you in for a weekend. And you go, I'm in for a weekend. That's about three years in. I mean, this is it's different levels. And then for me, 2009, I was supporting Rob Brydon on tour, playing big theatres. I was, I was well known on the comedy circuit in clubs, but I, wasn't, I couldn't tour in my own right. And I got the Royal Variety performance. And that was... Uh, for me, this yeah, 2000, and I met the Queen, and it was just brilliant because I was completely unknown on the bill um, in, in terms of the wider comedy world. I'd done odd bits of cable TV, but very little on mainstream TV. So to be on the Royal Variety was fantastic, and to, to you know, to meet the Queen was a complete. And I'm not a big royalist at all, but I would die for that woman. Love her. Yes, basically, you have to, not massively, you have to do things, anything too colloquial for, I mean, I think I've done, doing abroad places like Switzerland, um, Germany, Netherlands, um, especially especially the Netherlands, they're very cocky, they, they do speak great English, but they think they speak better English than they actually do, because they miss certain jokes, I find. Sorry, not we haven't done Holland for a long time, but, um, but... Yeah, you just have to be clearer. You can't be too... And you also have to think in sort of American English. It's the same changes you'd make if you were playing in America or Canada. Um, but I, li I do like playing abroad because I'm seen as very English. So I pati I've done a lot in Canada around Just for Laughs. Mon I've toured it ju with Just for Laughs across Canada. I've done Montreal several times, four or five times. Um, and that's a... I really like being the very English guy. And then you have places like, it is, it's different levels. Places like Australia, hardly have to change a thing because they're actually so like us, even though they think they're different. They're not. You have to change, you know, the odd word. But So it's a different levels, different levels of change. But it's, I, I enjoy going abroad. I tend to be more successful abroad because um, people just, I used to get laughs just saying hello in Canada, going, hello. And they go, oh, it's a funny English idiot, you know. It's how far you have to go to turn it into a stand-up comedy sh gig, which is what you're doing, really. Um, the problem for me is when, pe is when people think it's like music and they can put it on in the corner and it doesn't really matter if people pay attention or not. It's not. It's, it's somewhere between music and theatre. It's not as difficult as theatre to key into, but you need a bit of focus and attention. And also, it, you know... A comic can deal with a little bit of, with, of having to deal with movement to the room, with what's going on and, and what's happening in the environment. But it's not, it can't be in the background. You can't go, oh, we'll have a listen to the comic or not, because gradual chat and disinterest will, the, the comic needs attention more than a musician. So it's, it's finding people who don't, you know, it's finding ways to know that. I once got off, oh, and also, should I tell you the worst thing that actually my agent at the time turned down without even asking me and I was rather impressed that they did I was once offered a gig to go to Brussels get on the Eurostar and do a gig coming back now they didn't set up a room for me to do the gig they said could you go from table to table being funny and I don't know you know maybe some old style comics could do that but it would still be weird old style comics going I'll tell you a joke about a duck I'll tell you a you know and they'll come and give you a joke most modern comics are not going, I tell you, you know, do you want to hear about the Englishman, the Irishman, the Scotsman? Most people aren't doing that. Um, I would say it might suit your company if they're very, very near retirement or you're getting some old boys back in and that's very old people. Might go, I'd like to hear an Irishman joke, or whatever, something vaguely racist. Um, no, but something of that formula. It's, it's the idea that, uh, that it's not a show and it is a show and it is creating a show. And most people know that, but it's just, that's why we find a dance floor tough um, or that's why we find god i've presented stuff in a shopping center with people walking past admittedly that was more a presenting job but if you'd really expect me to do a stand-up gig with people walking past shopping in the middle of thing it's not going to work it's got to have more center more focus i think you've got to it's they love stuff that's about them uh, but you've got to do it from the point you you can't you can't pretend to know what to understand what they do. So I always do it from an idiot's point of view. I always go, oh, you know, finance people. I'll go, oh, I don't really know what you do. I know it's vaguely evil. Um, something like that. Something that I that is just silly and fun um, 
and from the idiot layman's point of view because the, and, and sometimes people will try and explain the intricacies of their business and you've got to realize that's the reason we're in showbiz we weren't good at this at school we don't understand but i mean some of the most fun i've had have been the most highbrow science things we <laughs> just could there's just no way there's no way i'm ever going to understand anything what you do and they're all very into, you know intellectual um so i like making jokes about what they are and about what they you know and uh, people who work all the different things healthcare or politicians are there or or something um but but uh but you've got to do it from a certain point of view for me. So I, yes, I do like doing jokes about it, but I also like the safe jokes are also the ones that we often, we are doing in our normal set that is about being a man of a certain age, being married, being in relationships, all the things that are universal. Those are also the jokes that are gonna make up a lot of our set because then we know we're gonna connect with you on it. The strangest in terms of Masses, massive budget for a tiny event was uh, for a hedge, ex head fund manager. I think he's retired early, uh, and he booked out Cliff. I never know how to say it. Cliveden is how it's spelled, but it's Clifton, isn't it? Clifton, uh, the you know, uh, with the big house. He booked out the whole thing for about him and 30, 40 mates for a Christmas party. He does something massive every year, and there are little cottages on the estate. And we went to one little cottage where they'd hired out a room, and. It was James Morrison first, then me, then Roger Daltrey, and um, it shouldn't have worked because it was, first of all, doing a gig to 30 people. As, I mean, as a musician, they'll sit and listen. But it was, also, you know, this incredibly loaded man. I was obviously, I was very worried about it because I'm in front of him and 30 of his mates and they all know each other very, very well and you're the big stranger in the room. They were so lovely. I found out that they've done it for years. McIntyre's done it, Sting's done it, all these, you know. Um, and... Uh, and it was just fantastic. And it was, it was really, really enjoyable. But it was one of those events where you go, not sure this will work. And they went, don't worry, it will work. We always do great, it always works great. <laughs>